So good morning, good afternoon everybody and welcome to this joint BIA ABPI Brexit briefing webinar uh, for March. Um, uh, I hope you can all hear me, uh, we are using a new system for the first time and uh, we uh, are ready to go. Uh, Ginny Acher from the ABPI is joining me from uh, uh, FPR HQ, so Ginny I hope you're on and able to speak to us. I am indeed and it feels like I'm living the Brexit dream, you're in London and I'm in Brussels. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, I hope what we'll be able to do in, in this uh, around half hour together is give uh, everyone uh, an update on the UK EU Life Science Steering Group that the BIA and the ABPI have been working on with the, uh, with the UK government. Uh, well then I, I hope I'll be able to give you some of the external context for, the, uh, for what's going on in Brexit uh, and explain why I think um, uh, what we're going to see is something like an episode of uh, Dynasty. Uh, and then we'll finish with some key dates and timings of things that are going to go, go on and uh, a quick update on industrial strategy in the UK and the budget. Uh, well, will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the, uh, end of the time and please use the chat facility uh, online if you wish to do so. Um, some of you will have joined us before for BIA Brexit briefings. Some of you may have joined ABPI BIA joint Brexit member debriefs uh, and I hope that this approach combines both of those. Jenny, uh, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it makes great sense and I'm glad to kick off and I love the, the dynasty <laughs> link. So uh, as you know, this is a bit like a box, watching a box set, so I thought I'd cover previously on, uh, for those of you who uh, who've, uh, haven't been with us before, but last month we covered these issues, uh, where we're up to, how the Brexit process was working, and this is of course still available on uh, our BIA YouTube channel. So if you want some of the work from those contexts, uh, do go to this, um, uh, and I'm going to pick up from here. We won't cover everything that we did last month, but those are in the last ones. So the UK uh, EU Life Science Steering Group meeting uh, met last week, uh, and it was very positive, and there was recognition both by the co-chairs, Andrew Whitty and Pascal Surio, and the ministers of the amount of work that had been done uh, by ABPI and the BIA and its members um, in the run-up to the meeting last week. And the key aims of this meeting were to clarify strategic intent for regulatory plans post-Brexit in medicines, engage more fully uh, government's focus and effort on trade matters and what might be the implications of Brexit for um, pharmaceutical uh, and life science trade, gain recognition from government and industry that we've been deliberating in a constructive and collaborative way, and to make sure that life sciences remain a priority sector for the negotiations. I think that these, uh, uh, these uh, aims were largely met during the meeting and we have secured ongoing support for the Life Science Steering Group and deep dive work streams that support it that many of you have been engaged in. So thank you very much for your, your hard work. It was commended by uh, ministers uh, and leading CEOs. I think it was a great meeting in terms of tone um, uh, and, and it was really um, great to see that uh, government can see that we are working in a can-do way. And I think it's likely that the steering group um, well, the steering group will continue and it's likely um, that we'll do uh, the next meeting in the summer or early autumn. Ginny, have you got comments on how it went? Just to confirm for everybody that, you know, it really was such a difference uh, from September and, and the way uh, I was describing it to my team recently was, you know, the first meeting felt more like, a, a, you know, it was a, an opener discussion and if anything, the, the especially the commentary from our colleagues from uh, Degsu were much more of, you know, come on, just get over it, just get over the decision and, and move on, whereas now the feel is very much get on with it, you know, you're doing a great job, let's get moving with this plan, and it really felt like we have turned a corner in terms of really building a, a, a working uh, collaboration, which of course, if people remember, casting their minds back to September was probably our most important goal, so it's just great to see that come to fruition and really great to hear uh, the comments that Steve and, and my boss Mike Thompson had from, from the ministers. Thanks Jenny. So moving on to some of the topics that were discussed in that meeting. Um, obviously an extensive one was regulation. Uh, together we put forward a paper with a specific proposal outlining how uh, closer regulatory alignment with Europe could work in practice. Um, we would worked this up with legal advice and is a solution that we believe is achievable and in the interests of the UK, EU and most importantly patients. Um, this will need to be done in the setting of a new trading relationship with Europe and a, a bespoke solution. Um, 
and we asked uh, the government to commit to the continuation of this important subgroup and I think there was uh, a desire to do that. Our work is necessarily addressing uh, all aspects of the regulatory life cycle of a medicine, whether that be clinical research, licensing, manufacturing, post-marketing requirements and pharmacovigilance. And this does have some overlaps with the trade work that's going to be discussed shortly and with elements of the industrial strategy. Um, we, we asked that the government set out its strategic intent for medicines regulation in alignment with our recommendation in a public speech and we're hopeful that may happen in the next quarter. Um, we're trying to make sure that the overriding concern must be for, uh, for people who need access to medicines, uh, patients and others and that these, uh, this, is, um, this is enabled by whatever deal comes forward. Jenny, do you have thoughts on, on the regula regulation discussion? I think people should be um, really grateful to the fact that in the regulatory space we do have a local, you know, in the, in the UK we have a strong national regulator in the MHRA um, and the bodies that support it like uh, the National Institute for Biological Standards, so the NIBS group. I, I think that has made it really possible to progress this work and I say this almost as a, a precursor to um, the discussion we're just about, about to have on trade because here we have a, an internationally leading regulator and that really is, it makes it helpful when you're trying to work through planning to be able to really um, work with a problem owner from the government side who really gets the issues and I think that is really, uh, was really revealed in, in the presentation on the 1st of March and really the program of work that Steve just described. So I think we, we all think that this is going well and it's a testament and thanks to the uh, great level of input from experts in member companies uh, working closely with the, the MHRA. Uh, there's going to be plenty of um, twists and turns with this going forward but I think there is a common position and I, and I hope that in the next month or so we'll be able to talk about um, the government being um, public in this area. Moving to uh, another area that was discussed uh, at the um, the ministerial meeting, trade and tax. Um, again, there were industry papers which set out the issues we've sought to address in the working group, not only the importance of tariffs and, tariff and customs, but also um, the access to 34 free trade agreements now established by the EU. And our goal is to establish a, a system for trade that is, in the Prime Minister's words, as frictionless as possible, recognising the challenge in negotiating terms, not only with the EU 27, but with WTO member states if we end up with a WTO arrangement. And I think it was good to be able to look in detail at the uh, issue of supply chains, how supply chains work in our sector, and explain that um, to, uh, to, to government uh, and the various bits of this. I think regardless of final terms, we also have to plan for a period of time where there might be um, transitional trading arrangements following our exit, um, and they need to be planned and established. And I think the scale and complexity of changes to trade and supply, um, we need to think about those over a decade rather than over a, a couple of years. I think that this has led to a new level of understanding by the government of the and the negotiating team of the government um, of the, the complexity in this area. I mean, we were able to talk about how EU-US mutual recognition for GMP inspections um, is now agreed as an amendment to the EU US MRA text, not TTIP, because TTIP is languishing. And um, you know, we're able to get into some of the, the detail of those things here. I think the next steps is that the work will continue, they'll refine the strategic priorities, and I think the government finds the expert input at a sector level highly helpful as they find their way in this increasingly complex area. Ginny. Yeah, I'd go even further, Steve. I think without you all, without the subject matter experts from the membership, um, I think it wouldn't really be possible for them to do the detailed planning on the sector the way they want to. I mean, they're obviously approaching 51 sectors uh, and looking at the trade issues, and I'm sure all of the other sectors are, are equally vocal about why frictionless trade has to be sorted out for them. But in our case, and what's been really critical, is not only dealing with the pragmatic issues of, as Steve says, what happens in a transi transitionary state, uh, but the pragmatic with respect to the fact that our medicines and the elements that go into our medicines aren't, aren't as um, simple in terms of trading arrangements as maybe another type of product. We have some practical physical requirements that really will test the government in its planning 
and its own cap capacity development. You know, do we have the right sort of facilities at the border ports? Just simple stuff like that. Up to, you know, do we have the systems that can scale up to deal with the number of transactions we'll be involved with? Um, those are uh, those are issues that I think perhaps, you know, I, I know if you sat down with a bit of paper, you eventually could work out. But it's so much easier to have those experts around the table who can help you think about that with respect to different types of products. So that's what we're going to be doing um, with the government in, in the coming weeks. Thanks, Jenny. So why do I think Brexit, or we should think about Brexit, a bit like Dynasty, Colby's versus Carrington's? For those of you who remember back to the 80s, and I realize it's not all, not all of you are as old as I am, or remember Joan Collins as Alexis Colby, Linda Evans as Crystal Carrington, and John Forsyth as Blake Carrington. I always remember him as the voice from Charlie's Angels for the TV aficionados. But I think in a sense, we've been looking at this from the UK perspective of understanding the UK family, understanding the Colbys, and the machinations that go on within that family, and it's important to understand how those things are going in the UK government. There's also quite a lot going on in the Carringtons, which I'm going to characterise as the EU27. And if we're going to understand how this plot is going to evolve, it's important to understand the rivalries within the families as well as the rivalries between the families as there's going to be this discussion going forward. I could have done it as Romeo and Juliet, Montague's and Capulets, but I'm afraid I'm not quite highbrow enough to do the Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare analogy. So first of all, I'm going to take you through the Colby family story and what's going on in the Colbys. Then we're going to go through what's going on in the Carringtons, and then we're going to see where we've got to on it. So bear with me as I go through this. So what's going on in the, on the UK side of the house? What's going on in the Colbys? Well, uh, big news uh, is going to be next week. There's a, a big week in Parliament in the UK. Um, the Prime Minister is due to speak in Parliament on Tuesday. It was going to be Monday uh, about the European Council. And this gives time for the bill that enables the triggering of Article 50 to go through the House on Monday. So we could be seeing the triggering of Article 50 as early as Tuesday next week. Doesn't can't guarantee it, but it, that that does rely on the Brexit bill completing its parliamentary journey uh, on uh, uh, going through. There's been uh, amendments in the House of Lords uh, this week, which means that uh, it will go back to the Commons on Monday. They will then send it back to the Lords, and then then there will be a decision as to whether the Lords sign it off or whether they, they, they keep going and try and continue to have a row about this. So uh, this is going to be busy at the beginning of next week and we could see from the uh, the Colbys, from the Brits, the uh, the triggering of Article 50 is beginning at the beginning of next week. Um, it could be constitutional arguments, who knows, I think it's a watch this space and it's going to be an exciting uh, bit of that at the beginning of next week. I think also the other discussion that's going on in the Colbys in the UK is they're starting to see we're starting to see the context, the discussion around how do we how do we pay the bill? What's going to happen uh, in uh, in terms of uh, a money discussion here? Obviously, the UK referendum campaign was dominated by the bus, which said that we'll have 350 million pounds coming back for the NHS. Um, but actually, uh, you've got now uh, also uh, a, a discussion whereby uh, it's expected that the European Union may well say, actually, there's a bill for, for the divorce. Uh, it could be as much as 60 billion euros. And I think here, uh, that you know, that, that 60 billion is seen as Britain's potential obligations in three areas: binding budget commitments that were paid after Britain leaves, pension promises on EU officials, and contingent liabilities like the bailout loan to Ireland that could require payment in certain circumstances. And I think this is a uh, discussion that's crystallising in the UK. The UK contributes around 12% of resources available to the EU's budget, is a significant net contributor, um, and uh, we'll see uh, which way this goes. I think there are competing interpretations about how this might go. There's some useful documentation, and I'll point you in the direction of the House of Lords EU Committee report and the Centre for European Reform report on this area if you're interested in this debate. Um, uh, I think that there will be a discussion about parallelism versus sequentialism from the European side and then there will be a discussion within the UK about whether the UK is willing to play, pay sums to get leverage in the discussion. But I think this is the emerging discussion on the Colby side within the UK uh, that we're looking at. I'm now going to take you to the Carringtons uh, to, uh, to, to see what Crystal and Blake are up to in the, in the EU and there's a few pieces that are emerging here. I mean, one of the important things this week we, or this month that we've seen 
is the EU white paper. This is the European Commission's paper to the EU27, Reflections and Scenarios on the Future of Europe. Um, and with these five scenarios uh, uh, as to what the EU27 may do uh, post Britain's decision to leave. And I think the idea here is that, um, uh, that this is an important paper as to, um, that will be, uh, be discussed at the upcoming Rome summit. Um, if I can look, think about it here, I think the paper is interesting and it acknowledges that uh, there are ex there's a challenge for the future of the EU. Um, you know, the, the, the challenges of migration, the challenges of the Eurozone remain, and then give some ways that the national governments may wish to think about this. Keep calm and carry on. Go back to doing uh, nothing but the single market. Um, uh, enable those who want to do more to do more, a sort of coalitions of the willing approach. Uh, doing less effectively, tackling certain priority areas, perhaps uh, border and coast guard, a single voice on foreign policy, a defense union, or uh, even greater integration further than ever before in all domains, which is scenario five. I think it's um, it's interesting to see this as a discussion going on uh, amongst the EU27. I think we could see some of this in uh, um, uh, in President Juncker's State of the Union speech, taking these forwards in September, uh, and it may frame the thinking uh, within which the, the Carringtons, the, uh, the EU27, approach the coming Brexit debate. Also, I think, interestingly, and I'm going to dive into uh, the EU Internal Market Committee of the European Parliament here. There's some interesting stuff coming out there. If you look at the, some of the discussion that's been going on in this committee, which is responsible for the legislative oversight and scrutiny of EU rules on free movement of goods and services, movement of professionals, customs policy, standardization, and the economic interests of consumers. They've been looking at Brexit. They've had a seminar on the economic in impact of Brexit. And uh, one of the ones that they looked at here was, uh, was, was this slide was presented to them. And it, if you look at it, what it shows is that the impact uh, in terms of uh, Brexit is as felt as equally in, in, in Ireland and then differentially with, um, amongst different member states uh, by the various options that happen. I think it's interesting to think about this in terms of uh, how, uh, how the negotiations will go on. The committee also produced a, a resolution which will go before the parliament and there's some quite interesting stuff in here. Uh, I'm pointing you here at uh, a couple of paragraphs, paragraph three and paragraph four of their, of their, uh, of their recital for the, the parliament. Uh, and you can see here that uh, they're arguing for that it's in the mutual interest of the EU and the UK to pursue a special relationship, which includes arrangements regarding deep mutual market access in goods and services, and calls on the negotiators to prevent the withdrawal agreement from generating any disruption to existing market access rights and obligations in, in accordance with the four freedoms. So there's some interesting things going on within the, the EU uh, where, um, where I think they are getting their arguments together. And it's interesting to see the Parliament uh, having some uh, calls for continuation on areas that are important for us. Another context is, uh, I think it's always worth uh, looking at interesting characters. And EU Chief Negotiator Michael Barnier should be added to your Twitter list. Uh, he's a frequent Twitter user and, uh, and uh, there's a good running commentary that he provides on his activities and what he's been doing, as you can see from, from the things here. You know, various seminars with the EU27 Council and EP on reciprocal rights of UK and EU citizens post-Brexit. And he's putting citizens first on, on that one. Uh, he's arguing for early agreement on principles of an orderly exit and more time for trade discussions afterwards. Uh, I think people are quite used to following President Trump. Perhaps it would be useful to make sure that you keep an eye on what Michael Barnier is doing if you want to understand what's going on in the Carringtons. I mean the EU27. And likewise... Hey, yeah, 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 go ahead. <laughs> no, I just I wanted to ask you a question. So uh, Michel Barnier's quote there about you know or getting getting the deal done first on the divorce. Uh, or however we are going to frame that between the Carringtons and the Colbys. To what extent do you think they are going to use the $60 billion as a way to um, basically hold you over to, to agree to a, a quicker process for the exit so that you can get to the trade decision? So in other words, pay up and we'll sort this out quickly so we can move on to the trade issues, which are really what you're going to need to get to quickly. 
do you think that's in the in the mind of the the Carringtons? Are they are they using that bill as a as a nice little brokerage to get to a quick resolution on the exit? I, I don't know. I'm not close to this. Uh, I I read with interest the sort of the the runes of the politics of this, and there is some talk that that's exactly the the thinking. But I don't think we will know because I think both sides are holding their cards pretty close to their chest. Tests. Uh, I think uh, the next step will be Article 50, um, and then I think we may see some moves from the from the Carringtons from the EU 27. Um, and what that may be, I don't know. I think it, it could well be as you as you anticipate. I think that's a sensible reading of the runes. But um, I, I, other than uh, other than to speculate, I don't know what's going to be the next ch next chapter of this fantastic story that we're all involved in. I will keep going with a couple more contexts and then we'll, we'll, we'll sum up and take some questions. So uh, this is, if you like, the family tree of the, the gang, the, the Carrington gang that are going to be uh, looking at Article 50. But they're, they're now, they've changed their name from the Commission Task Force for the Preparation and Conduct of the Negotiations with the UK under Article 50 of the TEU, and now they're just called the Article 50 Task Force. I suppose Stabby. there's some, some, some development there. Uh, you can see the various names here of the people who are involved, and you can see uh, that, it, uh, that they are uh, they will coordinate the Commission's work on the strategic, operational, legal, and financial issues related to these negotiations. What's going to happen next? Um, not the next dates in the drama. Well, I've already said perhaps Article 50 could be triggered pretty soon uh, once the uh, bill is through the UK Parliament by uh, Theresa May, the UK Prime Minister. Uh, giving over a letter. Uh, we then expect there to be a period of time uh, before, uh, the, before. Uh, so we don't know. So we don't know exactly w when that's going to happen, but could well be this month. There may be that may be done in a very short one-line letter. It could be done in a longer letter that sets out some expectations and some aspirations of the, the nature of the um, uh, the way that the the discussion could go. It's also not been confirmed if there was to be a letter, whether it would be published or whether it would be private. I think most of us are assuming that the 7th, 8th April European Council meeting will be used by the EU27 to discuss the negotiating strategy, and then people think that about six weeks after the trigger, the EU might respond to the letter, and after that, negotiations may take place. But some people think that they'll quieten down because uh, Brussels goes on holiday in July and August. So who knows, but that's a sort of a... Uh, my best guess as to what might happen. Of course, at the same time, we've got some European elections taking place. Um, March in the Netherlands, France uh, go to the polls for a new president in April, and the German federal elections are coming in September. Um, a quick flick through where things are at with that. We've looked at this last time, but just to give you an update, um, I think in France, the centrist candidate Emmanuel Macron has taken the lead for the first time in the polling. Uh, we all knew what polling got us to last last year, so um, take that with a pinch of salt. Um, uh, and uh, there'll be a, a runoff between the, the leading two if no candidate wins an outright majority in the first uh, in the first um, in the first round. The runoff would be on the seventh of May. Um, it looks like the previous Conservative frontrunner Francois Fillon is embroiled in his fake job scandal and seems to have disappeared off the. Uh, off of the, the leadership at uh, this moment, although I'm told he could come back. The Netherlands, um, uh, Gert Wilders is the uh, uh, the leader of the far-right Party for Freedom, uh, sitting on set, set to make um, the most seats in the, the, in the Netherlands parliament, but uh, in order to do so he needs to form a coalition and it seems that that's something other parties have ruled out, but I think we'll watch that with interest uh, this month. And who knows what will happen in Germany. Um, uh, I would say that uh, polling numbers suggest that uh, Angela Merkel or CDU are ahead, but uh, with a, a reduced majority from where they were uh, a few weeks ago. If I can take a step back now and say we know that Article 50 is likely to happen pretty soon, next week, the week after, um, I think that people in the sector should be aware that this is this may be a bigger moment than people have imagined because you may have uh, may have responses or instant activity from the Carringtons, from the EU27, in the form of um, uh, of things that they could they could do. We may see a position whereby things just carry on as normal, 
you can imagine a scenario where the European Commission issues a series of things that says things have changed and we're going to um, do things differently from day one. I don't know where we're going to be in that, but I think we should just take a moment to pause to say we might be in a position next week where it's business as usual, or we might see immediate disruption. What could that disruption mean? Well, perhaps things like UK uh, agencies not being able to lead as rapporteurs in European um, uh, regulatory submissions. I don't know. I am speculating. Um, so I think we need to be aware that it could be a moment of disruption as early as next week. Finally, before we come to questions, I'm just going to do two more things. Back in the Colby side of the house, the other side of Brexit, what's going on with the industrial strategy uh, and what's going on with the budget that happened uh, this week in the UK, and then I'll close. So work on the life science strategy continues under the chairmanship of uh, Sir John Bell for life sciences, and I think my expectation is that there'll be a government uh, paper published on our sector towards the end of this month or the beginning of next month. Um, I think that it's then likely the strategy will lead to a, uh, an ask for a life science sector deal, which may be done uh, later in the autumn. At the same time, we're continuing to work on, I know Ginny and the ABPI will also have an interest in uh, the government's industrial strategy green paper, which is seeking responses by formally by the April, 17th of April. Innovate UK's industrial strategy challenge fund, looking to support uh, important areas of uh, the future economy, uh, is, uh, is starting to look at its areas of priority and the Damon Buffini review on patient capital organised through the Treasury is ongoing, important for our sector. The budget this week in the UK had no mention of Brexit, but there were some interesting um, announcements for the life science sector, uh, including uh, some money under the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund for disruptive technologies, including biotechnology, that will also enable us to, um, I hope, uh, implement some of the work that we did in the advanced therapy Manufacturing Action Plan through MMIP. Um, the, 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 the government announced uh, 270 million to be allocated to biotechnology, robotics, and driverless vehicles. How that will happen, uh, uh, we don't uh, fully know yet, but it's likely to be through uh, an innovative, an Innovate UK scheme uh, with perhaps uh, around 100 million allocated uh, to schemes that will have match funding from industry uh, going forward. Um, there was a review of the R&D tax, uh, tax credits and the tax incentives, um, which was to look at uh, uh, the ways of introducing, uh, to make ways of making the, the UK an even more competitive place to do R&D. In a sense, this was uh, this didn't uh, lead to anything uh, very substantive. The Chancellor said the government had concluded that the R&D tax regime is internationally competitive and didn't outline any plans to enhance or reduce it. Uh, beyond which, he uh, did commit to reducing some administrative burdens for companies claiming relief, something that BIA has argued for, and to raise its awareness amongst SMEs, and they'll keep the system under review, perhaps a missed opportunity there. And then there was significant investment in um, um, science, technical engineering skills through some money for PhD places in, uh, in, um, uh, in science, engineering, technology, and maths, and some uh, 200 million to support new fellowships uh, for early and mid-career um, researchers. Uh, including life sciences and medicines manufacturing. So hopefully that's useful. Steve, uh, can I just bring in there just a minute think? on the, on that budget piece? So, I mean, the one thing I would point out is the uh, it, it is very welcome that the government continues to uh, expand um, some funds for research and for building better skills, which is terrific. But the one point that I know BIA and ABPI have really emphasized, and we continue to, so again, hearkening back to September, we had four key priorities. People in research were two of those four, um, so they still remain really important for us. And one of the things that we've been arguing is that they can't just think about this in terms of a paycheck or a checkbook. This is about connectivity, and I'm sat here in the Carrington's house uh, because today we were reviewing IMI projects. And uh, again, every time I come to these um, review meetings, the number of participants from the UK is just, you know, without without parallel in Europe. That is very much at risk, depending on what these outcomes will be, and how we can continue to play in that. And by the way, it's not just your universities. It's, of course, SMEs, but it's also the MHRA uh, and NIBS who play important roles here. So just to reassure everybody that although we haven't spoken about it in, in the, the presentation today, this is, still remains two of our four priorities. We haven't dropped them, but we're going to be looking at them 
um, through different mechanisms and, and through different purchase points. And maybe it's a, a good subject to come back to um, once you cry um, is formally up and running. Absolutely, absolutely endorse that, Ginny. You're right. We haven't talked much about people or science here, but they are absolutely priorities for us. So if I can, I'm going to go to a summary and then I'm going to invite questions, which you can either do by raising your hand, which is uh, if you can do that electronically, typing in the chat box um, uh, will be the best way for us to do it. We have significant numbers on the phone, so I don't want to open the line without. Uh, I think it will be uh, we become scrum like. But what so what's happened this month and where are we? I think on Brexit, the work of the UK EU steering group, particularly on regulation and trade and tax, uh, has been positive and will continue. And there's a lot done, a lot left to do. Article 50 is imminent, and we may be in a different context as early as next week. There's lots of new stuff going on in the Carrington household, and I think it's worth making sure that we stay up uh, on the EU 27's perspective on Brexit because. This is going to be a negotiation between the UK and the EU, which we are going to be um, observers on to some extent. So I hope that that's been a useful update on uh, on the EU side. And then on industrial strategy, uh, you may see a life science strategy from the from the UK uh, as early as the end of, of, of March. And there are other opportunities to input green paper and the Buffini review. And it's good to see some announcements in the budget of industrial strategy challenge fund support for the sector. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, just take some questions and see if anybody uh, has any for us. So, uh, have, uh, have steps started on the development of a new UK-only process for clinical trial approval and or medicines licensing? Um, I think the simple answer to that is not yet, because our primary preferred option is close alignment with uh, the European process uh, rather than uh, than building a UK only process at this stage. It certainly is something that if the UK were to end up with the WHO option, we would need to do, but there's not been the focus of the discussion at this stage. Jenny? Yeah, and I think what we have done, which would help that, so it's not that you know, we haven't got any uh, plan B. The real point is if we've got all our planning done, which we've been doing since the summertime, we did that as a playbook because we obviously didn't know what the different scenarios might be. So she's absolutely right. The emphasis has been on our preferred approach. If we end up in WTO, um, we do have uh, analysis and work that we can pull out of the box and get to it. But I think focusing on the preferred option and, and seeing how that can work is really the priority for now because that's obviously um, the what really will make a difference for the UK and for our patients here. Thanks. <clears throat> Next question. Will negotiations wait to start until the German elections are finished? Um, I don't know is the answer to that. Uh, I think uh, because we've got both sides with their uh, playing their cards close to their chest, we, we won't know. I think um, it's speculation for me, but you know, my understanding is that the, the expected etiquette is that we'll see something from the UK fairly soon, alongside Article 50, then we'll see some form of response from um, from the EU uh, within weeks. I suppose the question is whether anything meaningful can be uh, negotiated uh, across the summer, or whether it's in the interest of anybody to, to get going on meaningful things early doors. Um, I think we'll have to wait and see, and perhaps um, the early uh, positions will give us a sense as to whether there is a desire to get down to meaningful discussions soon or whether people want to push it late and I think some of that may be in the context of uh, whether there is a deal on the money and some you know deal on the money done done, done soon but I think it's a it's a it's a wait and see on that. Ginny? Yeah no I'd agree with you if buzz on the street around here is is as questioning as it is in London um, the only thing again is they're anticipating there's still some hopefuls walking around here that think Article 50 may not be triggered, but <laughs> we'll have to see what next week brings. Yeah, it takes us on to a good question here. I, it says, you've mentioned Tuesday as Article 50 day, but I haven't seen any indication that the government will accept the amendments or that the Lords will drop them. Do you therefore think it's likely, or will it get pushed back a week or two? Um, I don't know is the honest answer. I think this will come down to the discussion in the House of Lords uh, next Monday whether 
there's an outside chance, I suppose, that uh, amendments could be adopted in the, the Commons. I think that that's probably unlikely. The government seem to want to push it through unamended. And then I think it depends to the extent to which the Lords decide to dig in. Um, I think it will be worth watching the news uh, Monday to see which way that goes. And I, 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 I don't have a close enough smell as to where the House of Lords is at on this as to know wh which way that will go. But it could be as early as next week. Or, or you're right, it could be uh, another couple of weeks of ping pong. Um, or perhaps um, uh, Theresa May will be phoning around looking for people to join the House of Lords so she can outvote the Lords. Let's just hope it doesn't happen on the day celebrating the Treaty of Rome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in the Life Science Steering Group meeting, did you get any idea of how seriously the government is taking the need for continuing regulatory alignment, and was there any discussion of a possible timetable for the relocation of the EMA? Jenny, do you want to take the first part of that? Did we get any idea of how seriously the government is taking the need for continuing regulatory alignment? Um, well, absolutely. So I think that's why we've asked for um, that's why we've asked for them to to make a statement of strategic intent so that they can make that clear um, to to the wider world. Uh, but I certainly, um, as Steve described from the meeting uh, that we had, had a clear, you know, it's, it was obvious. They had really heard the points and were very keen to understand how in practice it would work. Um, and obviously, it's a commitment that they can't make on their own. Obviously, that's a, a negotiated outcome, so they can't promise it one way or the other. But I, we certainly got an action to progress the analysis, which is, I think, a, a very strong message in my mind that they're, they're very open-minded about this. And we are hoping that when they're able to give that um, public statement of their strategic intent, it will be reinforcing that view that we will have. Uh, we'll be seeking a close uh, working alignment with the EU. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. I think that they there was a, it was a it was a, a sober and and realistic uh, and workmanlike meeting based on uh, on practical elements uh, rather than uh, than anything else this time round. Um, on the second part of the question, was there any discussion of a possible timetable for the relocation of the EMA? No, there wasn't, um, uh, and I, I don't have uh, have that timetable or uh, any. I don't think anybody does. Um, how do we align with the EU process if we are blocked from access to the EU IT portals, e.g. for the new CTR? Surely we would be forced to a parallel process. Uh, a sensible and uh, uh, an intelligent question around one of the many challenges there are around um, aligning closely the UK and EU, uh, remaining EU, uh, EU systems. Um, you're right, access to IT portals is critical for um, close alignment uh, and uh, if that wasn't to be forthcoming I think it would be difficult to to maintain the close alignment in the way that we envisage it. Jenny? Yeah and that's exactly what the MHRA are believing as well uh, and other members of the government that they do recognize that's important which is why I think uh, their view as, as is ours is that I wouldn't rule it out at this stage. Um, it, it is you know I know it looks challenging but it, it, it is something that we should be at least uh, proposing to our European partners for discussion because it will be uh, important, we believe, for the, the health and well-being of all the patients across Europe, whether that's the CTR portal or the, the huge vigilance uh, or whatever. And I know I'm asking some very, you know, th those are some tall asks, but we should be trying to, to go for that. Thank you. Um, comment here. Um, in order to preserve much of our regulatory consulting industry in the UK, we need to stay aligned with the EU Clinical Trials Directive and all other areas of medicines regulation. Otherwise, US and Asian companies will surely go to providers within the EU 27, will they not? If I, my comment on that is I think that um, excellence and expertise in regulatory affairs um, uh, you know, is not something that grows, grows on trees. Um, uh, and I think expert companies who can do great, great work for global companies uh, do that from the UK, not just for the EU market, but for the global market. So I think you know we should be confident in our capacity to do this. Um, would it be more tricky uh, potentially? Would it mean in, could it mean uh, going somewhere else for uh, to visit the EMA? Probably, but um, uh, but we are you know trying very hard to make sure that there's a continued alignment. Uh, as we go forward. Ginny, do you have a thought on that one? Yeah, and, and especially remember, I mean, a lot of the regulatory strength that we're relying upon um, are regulation and, and, 
approaches that the MHRA themselves were fairly material in, in driving. So the one thing they've been saying to us from the outset is that, you know, that they don't expect to be diverging because most of those ideas were uh, coming from the UK. So I would think particularly in the case of clinical research, um, you, they, will, they will stick to the, the good clinical practice requirements as, as internationally acknowledged. They will be looking to uh, align fairly closely, I would imagine, with those sort of requirements and standards for data um, from a clinical program that should support clinical research uh, companies to continue to do work here in the UK. But I tell you what, the most valuable thing, especially I think from the BIA and ABPI representation of the government, is that I think we firmly put CROs back in their frame because they are very good at forgetting about services um, in these discussions. They get very focused on medicine as a product and they don't think about the services. And that's been equally important not only in the regulatory comments but also in the trade. Um, so I think that's been um, you know, in, in really important that the trade bodies have been able to represent it and it's great that to have BIA members as well as ABI members who can um, be our experts in that space. Thanks Jenny. Um, do we have any sense as to whether the EU27 are open to continue collaboration from a regulatory perspective? Um, I think one of the things that has been helpful from my perspective through the work that we've done with the BIA and the ABPI group is it does seem to be um, a willingness to uh, for mul multinational companies to uh, continue to um, see the advantages of a single set of, uh, uh, of rules and a single process if that's alignable and possible. And I think we are um, we're getting the sense, and perhaps you've got, you're closer to this than I am, Ginny, but my sense is that Europa Bio and FPA are advocating a very similar position to that which the BIA and the ABPI are. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think we are keen to discover whether the EU27 are supportive of that. I mean, I hear the sort of macro position of, uh, from the German government occasionally that they're, they're not in favour of cherry picking, so they may not like special rules in special sectors. Um, so that's one to, to, to bear in mind. But I think, um, you know, we have a strong case to make. Um, patient safety is an international issue. Um, there are good reasons why the European... Um, system of, uh, of pa on, on patient safety were established prior to the European Union being established, which um, which those who have longer memories back to the 60s will, will will well understand. And there are particular ways in which this is established so that there are essentially still national regulators working in a, a common framework. So there are, there are many reasons where, where, whereby this is an easier one to crack than some of the others. Jenny? No, I think you've answered it really well, Steve. That's That's exactly right. Any noise on FDA alignment? Um, uh, Plenty of noise. So, Judy, do you want to try, try, try on that one first? Uh, okay, so first of all, we, be, we should be careful about what we mean by alignment. So um, when we've been talking about it uh, in the European setting, we're thinking about something that is quite meaningful, that how it would have the potential for work sharing arrangements, you know, participation in a full way. I don't know if that's what the FDA would ever have on offer. I think the idea that has been discussed, and some of you will have seen it in the newspapers, is an idea that we could, as a country, reference um, regulatory decisions taken by the FDA. And obviously the FDA is a very important stringent regulator for our sector. Um, they tend to be reasonably quick, and more importantly, they tend to be the place where people tend to go first um, if they're filing. So the idea that we might be able to be in uh, the first tier alongside the FDA I think is appealing to some, but this is not, um, I think there's a lot of devil in that detail. So exactly what does it mean to reference? Um, is that really just a case of a rubber stamping arrangement which would certainly, as I was talking about earlier, um, it, it stands strangely against the, the role that the MHRA plays not only in regulatory science but in the IMI work that we're doing. What, what kind of an agency normally does um, rubber stamping? That's normally uh, not something that you would find in a developed economy like, like the UK. Instead, I, I think the question would be, would there be something more of a uh, deeper review in that referencing? And that is all to be understood. We don't, we don't have any details on what the MHRA might or might not be considering. So is it always there as an opportunity? Yes, as also it would be, I guess, for other stringent authorities. So FDA isn't the only regulator. Um, we could think about Health Canada. There could be also uh, 
maybe alignment with uh, PMDA, the Japanese regulator, on, on certain areas. I think all of this is where we're trying to get to some, some detail now. But obviously, um, you know, that has to be thought in mind with any deal that we are pro progressing with the European Union. So all of these complexities need to be sat and thought through carefully to understand, will the Carringtons buy it or not? Um, because they are likewise thinking about what role we will play in their future. Okay, I'm conscious that we're at um, the end of the work week in the UK and you've probably only got another few hours if you're in the, the US, so I think perhaps uh, we shall uh, uh, end that both by thanking you for your participation and attendance. We welcome any feedback if you found it useful. Jenny, thank you very much and uh, I must thank my, my colleague Laura Collister who's done a hell of a lot of work putting the, uh, the slide deck together which I've then uh, put the dynasty pictures into. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, if you're interested in this scheme, uh, we do have more shows coming up. Uh, we'll do one on Friday the 7th of April and uh, Friday the 5th of May. I imagine we'll have had some, uh, some dramatic twists and turns by then, and I hope you'll find though, this uh, a useful way of doing it. Um, there are a number of upcoming events from both the BIA and the ABPI. Uh, many of you will be with us at Manchester next week. Uh, we've got the Medicines Manufacturing uh, event uh, in AZ site in Macclesfield uh, following Monday. Uh, and then I'll point you in the direction of a, a couple of uh, great events. I think particularly for this audience, uh, the ABPI annual conference, 27th of April in London, and the joint BIA MHRA conference on the 8th of June uh, might be particular, particularly apposite. I saw quite a lot of uh, questions around reg, and uh, uh, we're hoping that that will be a, a, a key yep. meeting where we will be able to have some useful discussion about um, where we will go through. Tickets are available, and uh, I would encourage you to, to put that one in your diary. Um, with that, I think I'm going to say thank you very much. Uh, do welcome your feedback. I hope it's of use. This will go on YouTube and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. If only I had the Dynasty music to play us out. Well, a bientôt from Brussels. How about that? <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs>